It's a pleasant October day in Rome, 2017, almost exactly five years ago. Hundreds of people, Italians, non-Italians, women and men, adults and children, hold a demonstration to support reforming Italy's citizenship law. It had been 25 years, 30 now, since Italy's current citizenship law went into effect. Known as Law 91, it effectively denies citizenship to nearly one million young people who were born in Italy, but not to Italian parents. Raised in Italy, schooled in Italy, a lifetime in Italy, but not Italian. Now, five years on from the demonstration, we're still waiting for the law to change. Even if you were born here, you go to school here, and, but your parents are, for example, of foreign descent, then you're not an Italian automatically. You have to wait for 18 years and then apply for citizenship. It is really, really hard to uh, get citizenship in Italy. The law punishes and restricts children and young adults who are Italian in every way except on paper, having lived their entire lives without setting foot outside the country. It forces them to pass up life-changing opportunities to wait in limbo to be recognized by the only home they've ever known. And with last month's election, Italy has taken a hard right turn for the coming years, putting citizenship campaigners on their heels and many fearing the worst. Welcome to the Speech Bag Podcast by Liberties, where we look at human rights and democracy issues across Europe. I'm Jonathan Day. In this episode, we look at Italy's citizenship law, one of the strictest in Europe and one that refuses to recognize so many people who were born in Italy, who have never left Italy, but who are nevertheless not Italian. The push to reform Italy's citizenship law has been ongoing for years, the hope of its success ebbing and flowing as the country's political tides have changed. Now, with results of last month's elections, there is concern that reform could be pushed far into the future. But still, civil society organizations, citizens' groups, and others are continuing their fervent campaign to change the law and bring certainty to so many people. Oiza Quince Obasli is a researcher and program assistant with the Italian Coalition for Civil Liberties and Rights, or CHILD. Oiza is the author of the book Corpi Estrane, Foreign Bodies, published in 2020, and she currently carries out research and project support in the areas of immigration, right to asylum, citizenship, anti-discrimination, and inclusion. Oiza, maybe a good place to start is to clarify Italy's current citizenship law, which I believe is essentially eus sanguinis which means through descent, uh, you get it from your Italian parents. And otherwise, it's very difficult to get citizenship there. In Italy, we have uh, a law, which is law number 91, and which was promoted and adopted in 1992. And basically, it is based on eus sanguinis, which in Latin means that you are an Italian citizen if one of your parents is actually Italian. So it's citizenship by blood, basically. If you were born by uh, foreign parents or foreign, um, foreign people, you, are, uh, you have to wait for until 10 years before applying for citizenship. And if you were born in Italy by na to, Nigerian, uh, to Nigerian, Ghanaian or foreign parents in general, then you will have to wait until 18 years old to apply for citizenship. So basically... Even if you were born here, you go to school here, and, but your parents are, for example, of foreign descent, then you're not an Italian automatically. You have to wait for 18 years and then apply for citizenship. So it is not even that automatic because, because even if you are 18, it is not, uh, they, do not give you, they do not give you citizenship automatically. You have to apply, you have to pay, you have to wait for all the uh, bureaucratic process, you know, it's really, really hard to uh, get citizenship in Italy. And basically, um, as, a, um, as an NGO, but people that uh, are activists and uh, have been campaigning for citizenship reform say that this, the current law that we have right now is so obsolete because the, the society in Italy has changed. We have uh, many, many people of foreign descent that are Italian de facto, but they're not they're legally recognized as such. So that is why we are asking for a reform. Also because, for example, if you are um, 18 years old and you haven't, and maybe you go to university or there are certain jobs 
that you cannot do if you don't have the citizenship. So, of course, it is difficult for people who do not have citizenship to apply for certain jobs. So that is why that, that, that is a problem for many people that were born here, for example, who do not have citizenship. Let's think also about all the children that we have over, like we have over uh, eight, uh, 800,000 children that are in school that were born in Italy, but they still do not have the citizenship. So that may create also some sort of discrimination among children because some are considered to be Italian and some are not considered to be Italian. Not long after the demonstration heard in the introduction, Italy's citizenship law was tightened by the government. The effort was spearheaded by then-Italian minister Matteo Salvini and resulted in the so-called Salvini Decree in 2018. The hardline law was unsparing in its harshness towards foreigners, especially those seeking asylum. Among other things, it abolished humanitarian protection for those not eligible for refugee status, but who nevertheless could not be sent home. But the Salvini decree also sought to make life harder for those non-Italians who were already in Italy, who had been in Italy their entire lives, and yearned to be Italian on paper as well. Basically, uh, the the case of Salvini made it harder to get the citizenship by increasing the number of months uh, of the bureaucratic procedure, so basically from 24 to 36 months. So for every single person that were, uh, you know, in the limbo of getting the citizenship, uh, with the Decreto Salvini, they have had to face a situation where they had to wait even more, you know, to, to get the citizenship. But it's not just waiting 12 more months in limbo, going about everyday life while the government drags its feet, right? Of course, it's never that simple. But I imagine, especially not in Italy, where the process has long been under fire for having absurdly difficult requirements, hoop after hoop to jump through uh, just to get citizenship. Yeah, for example, for the people who were born and raised in Italy, uh, you have the, um, basically to, ac- to acquire the citizenship, you have to live in the same place, not only in Italy, but in the same residence. You know, many, you, if you have a house in a certain uh, address, of course, you need to stay there. You have, you have to prove that your residence has been there for the entire years that you live in Italy. The exact same residence for 10 years. So... I take this to mean then that leaving the country for any real amount of time at all is almost impossible. So, for example, if there are uh, families that may go back to their own country for a certain period of time, that um, child that were born in Italy may lose the possibility even to get the citizenship. Because, of course, once you are 18 and you get go to the office and they see that have been a gap, you know, on your uh, on your stay in, in, in Italy, that may be a problem because they see that there is a gap and maybe they can tell you that 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 can be a complication for you to acquire the citizenship. So, yeah, there is not just a rumor. It's it's real. And we have, you know, different um, we have different uh, cases of um, Italian people of foreign descent that uh, are, are still fighting, you know, uh, with the with bureaucratic procedure or with the offices because, uh, maybe they they committed just um, this. I'm quoting the crime to go abroad because, of course, there is a gap. In, of course, they you have to stay abroad for a, a such pre, um, a pretty much a long period of time. But even maybe one month uh, in the country of origin of the parents may be a problem, you know, to acquire the citizenship because uh, that is um, uh, one of the main requirements to prove when you want to apply for citizenship residents, but also their income. So let's think about, for example, the people who uh, are not uh, rich, who are not in the mid, are not are not part of the middle class, let's call it that, that way. And if your income is not high enough, you don't have you don't have the you don't have the right requirements to get a citizenship. So for the people who are uh, especially of foreign descent, because it is, you know, uh, in Italy, uh, the people who usually live in Poverty or uh, um, in lower classes are of foreign descent, are foreign. So, for example, uh, it is a very difficult even for the people who are of foreign descent to acquire citizenship if one of the requirements, for example, is income. So we have to face also the problems regarding inequalities, uh, even on um, regarding this issue. The, the absurdity, according to me, is that if you are born or raised here, you're not considered to be part of the society. Um, you have to basically... Uh, you know, you, you have to, to go through 18 years of your life and you're not considered to be Italian, uh, even if you are, and the state doesn't want to recognize as, uh, as Italian. But of course, it is not just a matter of 
um, of identity because at, this, at the end of the day, that is something really personal, but it also uh, a matter of get, having access, access to certain services, access to certain jobs because you don't, don't have citizenship. Well, is it, how is this beneficial to Italy? The opportunities lost for, for those in limbo, be it in education, employment, social life, uh, all, all sorts of areas, is clear. But it also strikes me as costly to Italy. Like the, the current citizenship law just deprives the state, too. Yeah, that is obvious. I think that um, if you, I mean, if the government, if, if the state doesn't want to recognize these people to be Italian, it means that you are actually... Um, you know, stopping from, uh, I would say, evolving as a society. I mean, it is obvious that society is, I, I believe that a society gets stronger and stronger and also more, um, there is more integration if you actually consider uh, the people of foreign descent to be part of the society. So, of course, it is a deprivation for Italy, to, according to me, uh, keeping uh, these people, uh, you know, at the outskirts, I would say, of the society, because if you don't uh, recognize these people to be Italian, I mean, then um, there will not be, as, as I would say, an evolution of a society because, you know, uh, having different cultures, different religions, different, uh, again, culture is very important, according to me, for, for a society. And also, uh, not also that, but to me, it is very important that there is also um, recognition of different uh, cultures, ethnicity, and uh, the um, recognizing also that diversity can be an enrichment also for the society. So, of course, um, this uh, the um, the fact that the, the Italian government doesn't want to approve such an important law, it means that Italy is, is still you know kind of um, how can I say it? Um, maybe I would say backwards in the you know in in have in in trying to to imagine a society with with much more diversity. It is really really hard to actually change this aspect. Even me, that I am an Italian citizen, but I'm black, you know, so the people that not, do, do not perceive you as an Italian because your features, uh, you know, some, sometimes betray you because your features say that you are from another country, but actually I am Italian. So it is not even easy, even, even you know, in the minds of, of Italian to think that a person with different uh, features can be Italian. So to me, there is also a need to actually, you know, to work also on anti-racism, anti-prejudice, and try to make people understand that Italy is a diverse country. We have many differences. We have diversity. We have people coming from, you know, everywhere in the world. And many, many of them are Italian, you know, even if not, they're not recognized. Where is the public sentiment on this issue? Italy has a history, especially a recent history, of hostility towards foreigners. Um, issues related to migration are contentious, always. Is there any sense of how everyday Italians feel about reforming the citizenship law? Yeah, um, I think that, uh, okay, first of all, uh, I think that when we talk about, for example, the media and the way that, and the narrative on uh, on reform of citizenship, then you will see that the perception that you will have is that Italy will never change, that people think that reform shouldn't happen, basically. But to be honest, uh, according to recent surveys, for example, which actually surprised me, is mm, the recent, sur recent surveys say that six Italian over 10 uh, agree over on citizenship reform. 60% is, to be honest, higher than I would have guessed, I think. So I guess one takeaway for me would be that the need to change this law is resonating with Italians. If you uh, ensure that people are informed of what this reform is about and how the situation is in Italy, then they will understand and maybe they will see, okay, maybe we need reform because it is absurd that children who were born here and, and go to school here are not considered to be Italian. Uh, but still, I believe that um, there is, a, as I was saying, there is a lot, lot of work to do, especially on anti-racism, because um, I think that this is a reform that goes hand in hand with the world, with the work on anti-racism, and um, especially we. And I think we need to work also on um, on the concept of racism because maybe I see some difference between Italy and other countries where there are scholars, there are many, 
you know, activities concerning anti-racism that uh, or people that, you know, work even, even in the academic world that every single day, you know, give lessons or um, uh, work with the media to, um, to uh, in order to deconstruct certain stereotypes and stuff. In Italy, we do not have that. I mean, we do have activists, we do have even writers and now, black writers that are producing a lot of, you know, papers or uh, books as well activists, but at the same time, uh, it is really hard to uh, make people understand that, uh, as I was saying before, the society is, big, is, is changing. So um, I believe that new generations, that Generation Z or millennials are more open to uh, this type of change. But of course, we have a um, ruling class that does not reflect the, uh, the, the current situation, especially among the youth. So you may have a ruling class that is more conservative, that is um, less interested in, in, um, in facing these topics. So it is, it is harder to, um, you know, to, to, to make people, to, to make the ruling class also understand this topic and to be open to openly talk about racism because as I, for example, if you think about colonialism and the colonial past of Italy, uh, they usually say, oh, but the French were worse. Oh, but the, the um, um, English people were worse in the, in the colonies. But no, Italy was as violent as the French or as the British people. So that is what we are trying to make understand. And, you know, if we talk about anti-racism, citizenship, all of these topics have to go hand in hand with also what is racism and how to bring the concept of racism and how to, you know, bring also the concept of anti-racism. So that's, but that means that also black people and people of color in general need to be listened because they are, they are speaking out, they are talking. So um, it's really hard to be heard. That, that's what I'm trying to say, because sometimes there is this kind of uh, refusal, I would say, to actually listen and to um, understand that even Italy has a history of violence, of colonialism, of racism. So how do you get heard? How does Chilled campaign on this issue and penetrate through the fairly deeply entrenched sentiments of Italians? Yeah, so uh, Chilled has been collaborating and campaigning also with grassroots movements that have been working on citizenship reform. So for example, we have Italiani Senza Cittadinanza, so Italians without citizenship that have been working for this reform and this movement is, uh, is um, uh, formed by uh, non-Italian citizens. And um, we have been also um, um, published uh, reports and guides that uh, can be useful for uh, people, not only uh, those working for N in NGOs, but also for everyone basically uh, to know more about uh, citizenship in general because what we have noticed is that uh, Italian people do not pretty much know what this citizenship uh, what, what this citizenship is about so for example you have um, I mean people like me for example that I was born here and I got my citizenship but sometimes it is hard to explain to others what you have to go through so that's why we thought maybe we should uh, publish a guide, uh, a know your rights type of guide with frequently asked questions on what uh, citizenship is and um, the years of uh, legal residence, the years that uh, may take to get citizenship, etc. And we also publish another report called um, Trentanni Senza Lode, which means that, which is based on the fact that it has been 30 years that um, that we have been trying to uh, push towards reform, but for 30 years that didn't happen. So we uh, basically involved uh, legal experts, activists and um, people of color basically to give their own contribution to these reports um, that, um, so, so that they could um, um, share their point of view uh, from a legal point of view, but also from a social point of view. And um, we, um, our target is everyone. We do not have like a different, um, different clusters of people of different ages. Uh, we try to reach out to everyone. Um, so regardless even of the religion, but of, it is, but what we can notice is that um, um, uh, the, the youth is more open to this kind of, um, to, to listening, first of all, to listen to, to, to this uh, kind of topics and also to, um, uh, to be more involved on this. Also, the youth is uh, the main 
a category of people that is more involved in, into this activism and our grassroots organization that work that campaign, you know, for anti-racism, citizenship and stuff. Uh, but of course, we also hope that uh, our kind of approach will reach also to um, older communities or uh, to others, even religions, because also we need to understand that um, even the people who are uh, campaigning or activists that campaign for citizenship also they are for, of, of different religions so um it is not a matter of it's, it's not a matter of targeting just a specific category of people but it's well, we want to reach out to everyone what are the most effective ways to change minds about this issue is there a certain topic or theme like for example economic benefit or family togetherness uh, school that makes people stop and say, you know, huh, we have this wrong. We decided to use stories. So basically we decided to maybe, and also using interviews, uh, to use story and to interview people without citizenship um, at any level, but mainly uh, the youth. And we tried to, um, to take notes basically on the, what their the difficulties was without, having, without citizenship. Uh, I, th I think the most effective way to, um, uh, to communicate the, the issues concerning citizenship, I think it's cool because as I was saying before, we have, um, um, we have um, children, we have um, uh, teenagers that um, are over 800,000 in Italy that are, go to school and uh, maybe are um, even sports classmates where, where they're on uh, with their uh, peers and, and classmates. So um, if you use that kind of story, maybe you can also reach out to the families, you know, of Italian people that may say, okay, this guy goes uh, with school with my own child. And why does, doesn't this uh, may, maybe Ghanaian boy have a citizenship just the way as my son has? So we are trying also, we, we, we have tried also to use this, this kind of strategy to, um, uh, actually show that there are a certain type of discrimination even you know among classmates and um, by using using that was I think one of the uh, the it was one of the main strategies but also one of the strategies that, that work best but also we used also um, um, a strategy that was based also on um, on jobs and work and the economy of course yeah because we wanted to show that um, uh, how foreign uh, people in Italy can also be an, an important contribution to the economy uh, of, uh, of Italy. Um, so, um, as I was saying, um, for, but, but not just that, also sports, because as I was, as I was trying to say before, there are people who, uh, because, they, because they do not have the citizenship, they cannot compete at a national level because they do not have the citizenship. So how many athletes, for example, we are uh, losing because they do not have the right citizenship and cannot compete into certain. So we use different um, how can I, categories, we can say, uh, school, sports, uh, um, economic contribution, jobs, because as I was saying before, if you don't have citizenship, maybe you cannot apply for certain, for certain jobs. And um, yeah, we use also the, 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 mainly the stories that um, we um, we wanted to uh, we use the stories that um, people without citizenship told us through interviews and uh, also through um, written emails as well. So there are people writing to us that said they, they um, we, I mean, we worked with different movements and coalitions uh, and uh, they shared their stories basically with us and we uh, documented them. <laughs> Ci sono ancora tanti italiani che scelgono di non votare e se saremo chiamati a governare questa nazione lo faremo per tutti, lo faremo per tutti gli italiani, lo faremo con l'obiettivo di unire questo popolo. That's Giorgia Maloney, the leader of the far-right Brothers of Italy party, speaking shortly after exit polls in last month's election, confirmed that she is poised to be Italy's next prime minister. In her speech, she's saying all the quote-unquote right things, promising to lead for everyone, for all Italians. And her words may be accurate, if taken very literally. She may lead for Italians, but for others, even those who have lived in Italy their whole life, the skies are darkening. 
She's a close ally of Salvini and shares his views, his hostility towards refugees and other foreigners wishing to make their home in Italy. Oiza, it goes without saying that this election marks a huge setback, not just for fundamental rights in Italy, but also perhaps especially for those hoping to reform the country's citizenship law. So it's a very unfortunate situation. And of course, with this government uh, that um, is so hostile, we can say to immigration topic in general, but also to citizenship reform, it will be really hard. It will be a challenge to push for towards reform. Uh, it was harder before, even with left-wing governments. I cannot imagine how difficult it will be with right-wing uh, parties that are, are the government right now. We have a right-wing party that with this racist propaganda and with uh, its immigration, anti-immigration propaganda, especially in the media, has always portrayed citizenship, citizenship reform as basically a catastrophe where uh, even right-wing parties use these conspiracy theories about the fact that with the citizenship reform, there will be the so-called great replacement of white people because more women will be able to, you know, go to Italy through, uh, through the Mediterranean and uh, bring their children here and, you know, using this racist rhetoric. The Great Replacement Theory says that progressive immigration policies are part of a plot to undermine or replace the political power and culture of white people living in Western countries. It's an utterly absurd and dangerous conspiracy theory, but it's found a host with many of Italy's far-right politicians, including those set to head up the next government. And especially between 2017 I mean, no, 2014 and 2019, there has been this this kind of rhetoric by um, Matteo Salvini's party, the League Party, and Georgia's, Georgia Meloni's party, which is Brothers of Italy. And they have been using this, this kind of rhetoric and um, uh, it being also inspired by the right-wing parties in Europe. If you think about, I don't know, Hungary, like Viktor Orban, so we have certain similarities. So I think that one of the main problem is, yes, the weak, on the one hand, the weakness of left-wing parties in, uh, you know, pushing towards reform and, you know, also standing, really standing for the rights of the people who have been fighting. And on the other hand, we have also, unfortunately, a right-wing party, a right-wing party that through their racist propaganda can actually, you know, win over these civil rights somehow. And, um, and of course, this information plays a major role on this because, um, you know, as I was saying before, in Italy, if we don't have this that kind of, um, of uh, anti-racist work, you know, that need to be brought in schools, need to be brought at any single level, then you will be have that kind of disinformation and stereotypes and prejudice that, you know, are, um, you know, that work uh, for um, right wing parties propaganda. So the prognosis here, at least in the short or medium term, is that there's little hope of any progress to change the citizenship law under this coming government. You're skeptical of good news of any sort in the coming years. I think that um, I'm very skeptical because I don't think that there will be uh, an openness to reforms, to positive reforms, to reforms that increase uh, actually the, um, I mean, I don't think that there will be um, reforms uh, concerning migrants, concerning citizenship. Um, I don't think that there will be a sort of openness towards it. And yes, I'm very, I'm skeptical. I'm not positive about that. Uh, I think that there will be, that that it would be a challenge to uh, having to confront this kind of government, um, especially for everything concerning civil rights. It will be pretty hard because as I was saying before, um, Georgia Meloni's government, and they are very intolerant towards civil rights in general, uh, from citizenship to LGBTQ rights, etc. So it will be a challenge. But again, we are here. It doesn't mean that uh, the fight is over. Uh, we will still here and we will, you know, fight for the rights of people who, um, I mean, fight for everybody's rights, basically, and um, ensure that their rights are protected. Do you then have to recalibrate not just your internal expectations, um, but also what you openly push for? I guess what I mean is the demonstrations for you solely for birthright citizenship that we've seen in recent years now seem so much more distant, um, so much more hopeful. Is a full you solely still your realistic best case, so to speak, or is there some sort of in-between 
that and and where we are now so the best case um of course of course right now we have uh, the so called use call which means that um a reform that is based on um the fact that you can get citizenship that if you for example if um it, it, use call refers to the right to have italian citizenship if you arrived in italy before the age of 12 and you completed five years of school so Uh, this uh, would be uh, the reform right now. I mean, this was the the bill that was going to. Um, I mean, this was the type of, of reform that that um, not that we wanted, but the the type of reform that um, uh, we could um, yes th that we could get at the moment. But of course, in my own opinion, it would be better to be. I mean, it would be better if we, if we had like a new soli, like that everybody who were born and raised in Italy would get a citizenship regardless of any kind of requirement to me. But as I was saying before, you call it or you school to because we have two different names, but the, the meaning is the same. So getting citizenship before the age of 18 and after you completed five years of school, that would be an important step, of course, because again, uh, that would be, um, uh, it would it means, it, it would mean that finally, uh, children and teenagers that go to school would be recognized as um as italian citizen of course with if one of the two parents who must have this is not requirement who has a legal residence in italy um uh, express their their um their willingness okay to to apply for citizenship so it also depends on their on their parents but of course this would be an important step what's next for chilled then as you continue to campaign on the issue Of course, you won't stop simply because of the election results, but do they not only change your aim, but, but how you go about achieving it? Yeah. So uh, CHILD will keep working with grassroots movements, um, with activists, uh, with um, anybody, again, who, will, uh, who wants to fight for this reform, who wants to see this reform, citizenship reform approved. And of course, we will do anything that we can do to protect the rights of, of uh, people, especially the vulnerable community that in this case are people of foreign descent, migrants, etc. Um, what we can expect, of course, is nothing positive from this government, because as we can see, it is very hostile, it is very um, um, uh, intolerant towards um, citizenship reform, but towards Uh, everybody who is of foreign descent in general. So, of course, it would be really hard for uh, an NGO like CHILD to, um, to see uh, this reform, to actually um, push for reform and push the word reform. And it will be really hard also to have, you know, a com maybe also a, a dialogue, we can say, with the ruling class, with the, with the parties in the parliament, because, again, most of them will be Uh, um, exclu exclu um, except for, of course, left-wing parties, but the majority is uh, a, a right-wing party. So, of course, it would be really hard even to, um, to create a dialogue with them. But again, we will try, we will fight for this reform. It doesn't mean that we will abandon this, uh, this, this fight for reform, for citizenship, because it's a matter of right, it's a matter of, uh, again, of dignity, and of course, we fight for it. And again, if... Uh, Georgia Meloni's government, if we see that she will actually threaten the, the rights um, of, uh, foreign, uh, of foreigns or people of foreign descent, or if she will make it harder, you know, for people, even with this law, for people to get a citizenship, for, for example, by um, making it harder or making it or increasing the months for uh, bureaucratic procedures, of course, we, we will Uh, actually um, stay vigilant on that and if there is a case of course we can also reach out to competent authorities and or, or the European Court of Human Rights and see what we can do to protect the rights of the people who have seen their rights violated by this government. That's it for this episode of the Speech Bag Podcast by Liberties. For more, go to liberties.eu. If you have questions or comments for the show, we'd love to hear them. Send them along to podcast at liberties.eu. This has been a presentation of the Civil Liberties Union for Europe.